Greg Bryant here on location for WBGO at Yamaha Artist Services here in Midtown Manhattan and uh, with Andy Milne, Yamaha artist, band leader, improviser. I just want to say, first of all, man, how good it feels just to be in the presence of live music <laughs> after a five month hiatus, man. Just how good does it feel to play? Oh, that was an, un it's a kind of an underestimate of how much you realize you've lost something that you kind of take for granted, you know, and right. saying to the guys when we're just warming up, it's like, it really feels good to play with each other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it always feels good to play with them, but in particular, mm -hmm. you really appreciate when you've sort of had that withheld. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was really joyous. Absolutely, yeah. man. It, it, you can feel it and hear it in your guys' sound. It was, it was fantastic to witness. Oh, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. This is our first time getting to meet, like one-on-one, -on -one. Yeah. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on last year's highlight, the Juno Award, the thank Top you. Canadian Music Prize. Yeah, That's pretty you. awesome. Yeah. But when you think about it, you know, you've been with your previous group, DAP Theory, off and on for 20 plus years, but now Trio. Yeah. Why now? And why John Hebert and, and Clarence Penn? Well, I, I had sort of been dabbling with trio but not seriously for a number of years and i had close musical friends who were kind of constantly nagging me saying you shouldn't do a trio man you really mm. need to do a trio okay. people don't really know you as a pianist you know and, and i was like yeah yeah i'll get to it i had all these other projects that uh -huh. kept, kept coming up and i just I, mm. I um i found an excuse to sort of stall right until uh, you know, it was in around 20, 2017 and I, and I was reaching a sort of turning point in my life and a lot of mm -hmm. things were changing mm -hmm. both for me mm -hmm. and also for the guys in DAP Theory where we were sort of kind of having a forced hiatus. Right. Um, and at the time, my wife, Latanya, is a vocalist. She was wanting to do a new record and we had been doing a few gigs together and mm -hmm. I just started kind of uh, thinking about, well, if I was going to do something with a trio... I would like the trio to have the flexibility of being kind of a multifaceted sort of okay. identity where it could be a group that could collaborate with her. And also I could have my own, mm -hmm. you know, life with that group. And I thought, well, if it's the same musicians and there's a lot of synergy that we could just in terms of, in terms of how we perform. So mm -hmm. that was happening all at the same time. And it wasn't a planned thing. It was just, okay. you know, our lives were, everybody's stuff was changing. You didn't realize it. And it just mm -hmm. kind of hit me on that. Yeah. It's time to take this on. Mm -hmm. um, and then with John, in terms of the second mm -hmm. question, like why yeah, these guys, like yeah. John, I had been playing with in his group, uh, quartet rambling confessions for mm -hmm. several years at that point. And okay. so we'd been developing a really nice rapport. Right. And so I kind of, in my mind, I think I, I was pretty like excited about, you know, you know, sort of rounding that relationship out with a drummer and mm -hmm. I, but I wasn't sure who, right. And I, I, Clarence kept on coming back and, into my mind because every time I'd see him and I hear him play, I just think, Oh man, he's the, the, the dynamics in his playing and the colors in his playing right. were, you know, you know, kind of things that I sort of devour and the things I really like exploring mm -hmm. together with other yeah. plays as, as does John. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you kind of couple that with having great, a great feel, it was like, this is, this is a kind of an easy decision. And I remember, I remember hearing him mm -hmm. playing with Uri Kane at winter jazz Fest oh, wow. a couple of years ago. Wow. It would have been the beginning of that year, I think mm -hmm. 2017. And mm -hmm. I had just played a set and I stayed and listened to Uri's group. Mm -hmm. And I was just thought, I, I think I even called my wife who had, who had mm -hmm. gone home and I said, you have to come back. Because I didn't think she didn't know Clarence at the time. I said, you have to come back. Uh -huh. I need you to hear this drummer. Yes. And uh, so that was kind of like I realized, I said, you know, because we'd never played together, but we knew any, known each other and mm -hmm. heard each other and no you know, mutual, you know, it's like we just missed each other every time, you know. So mm -hmm. it was one of those things where I just thought, Hey man, I, did, I even said it to him. We rode down the elevator. I said, mm -hmm. we're going to play together now. I, and he goes, hey, wow. call me. I said, so yeah. And so that was the year that we started doing yeah. things together, partially with my wife and partially, mm -hmm. you know, as a trio. And, and then it just sort of kind of developed. And then when I um, sort of knew I was going to go full steam ahead, it was like, okay, now I need to sort of develop a sound for this group.
And you guys are in uh, the lineage of, of quite a canon. You know, I think about trios, Keith Jarrett and Ahmad Jamal, but also Oscar Peterson. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the few that got to sit under him directly. And I've got to ask you about <laughs> that, man. How was Oscar? What was he like? I mean, Oscar was a sweet cat. I mean, he uh -huh. was he was such a but he's such a force and such a presence that, mm -hmm. you know, he walked into the room and he didn't have to do anything. It's not like he was trying to make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but like for, for me as a young black kid growing up in Canada, and yeah. this is this, this international jazz icon who mm -hmm. is just a you know a monster pianist. Yeah. It's very hard to sort of sit in a room with him and not be intimidated. Yes, um, because of the presence of him, and especially at that time in his life, he was just he was still pretty healthy. So you know he had he just had an aura. Um, that you kind of, you, you know, you just, he would come in, he was so super chill, and it was like, <laughs> but you couldn't help but freaking out, you know, you heard, oh, he's coming to class, and it was mm. like, he would come to an ensemble that I was in, mm. and that was the group that he would work with when I was going to school. Whoa. And and he'd sit down at the piano bench, and it wasn't an instrument like this, mm. or, you know, the Bosendorfer that he's known for playing, you know, but it was, it was, um, it was like a little Yamaha upright in a, in a classroom. Wow. wow. And I, well, the the probably the profound lesson was that he would always sound like Oscar mm -hmm. on that little upright mm -hmm. that was usually out of tune. Mm -hmm. Kind of the hammers were beat. It was <laughs> yeah. it was a tough instrument to play. You yeah. know, I was always my excuse. I was like, I can't play on this mm -hmm. instrument. It's just the piano. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then he sat down on the thing, mm -hmm. and it sounded like Oscar. And I was like, damn, that that got to take that excuse out of the window. And I just mm -hmm. it, it threw it out the window because I was like, oh, that's got nothing to do with the instrument. I mean, yes, yeah. a great instrument helps. Right. Right. But but you can't sort of you can't rely on the instrument to say that's what my sound is, you know, and I think that I, mm. that was a really important lesson just to sort of he didn't ever have to say it. He just showed it. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Wow. But he was a really wonderful person to me. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I was fortunate I didn't get as spend as, nearly as much time with him as I would have liked. But, mm -hmm. you know, I have actually be, over the years more recently have become oh. really good friends with his widow, Kelly. OK. You know, and even. By extension, his influence and um, just sort of position in my life mm -hmm. extended through her where the first time she came and heard me play, mm -hmm. I was nervous because she was in the room. Wow, yeah. You know? Yeah. Which is She's funny. heard it all, right? Yeah, it's just, <laughs> she's heard it all. And yeah. it's like, she's not a pianist, yeah. but it's just mm -hmm. like, that was my connection to him through yes, her now. And it's yes. like, I, I, it was like, oh God, I, I said, mm. Kelly, I'm so nervous you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dig that. I dig that. Thank you. 
You talked about having your own sound and, and just the, the majesty of the instrument. And I got to tell you, Chris, if you can get a close up on this right here, um, I'm seeing some natural essences here <laughs> in, in, in the piano, some things that I might have gotten in uh, bad trouble about as a, as a uh, toddler in the early 80s if I'd have done this. But you know what you're doing. Tell, tell us about uh, oh, what we're well, looking at here. We're looking at some, tw <laughs> some, some spare parts and some, some twigs that yeah. I've collected over the years in mm -hmm. different locations. But uh, I guess it was about 2008, I started a piano duo with a very good friend of mine, a pianist, fabulous pianist, really creative guy, uh, just a genius, really, a gentleman by the name of Benoit Delbecq. Mm. And Benoit I met in 1990 when we were both students at the Banff Center and okay. we were studying with a, a whole host of folks but the pianists were studying with Stanley Cowell at the time oh wow and Benoit was into prepared piano like this back then mm -hmm. um, when he's just like we were in our late teens early 20s mm -hmm. and um, he you know has has sort of it's evolved a lot but he really corrupted me when we started that duo because we uh -huh. started experimenting with 
color that way. I'd been toying around with things a little bit, but Benoit mm-hmm. kind of pushed me in a, in a really interesting direction where mm-hmm. we're not really, and I always have to get like uh, you know, approval from piano technicians, and especially uh-huh. here because these are really finely maintained instruments, mm-hmm. but um, to make sure, because to, uh, traditionally people tend to hear the word uh, preparations in the piano and they, they're, they freak out because sure. the, what's normally associated with that is metal being forced in between strings mm-hmm. and things that don't uh, generally instruments don't generally like you right know? so this is right. not much force at all uh, mm-hmm. because it's just it's just muting a string and it's mm-hmm. giving a little bit of resonance to a note so then so that yeah it's muted but it's also good and I, I I don't I, when I'm playing with Benoit in that duo situation a lot of the more of the music is um, focused on and built around some of these prepared textures so there's more happening in the middle of the piano right but in the, in when I'm playing with the trio it's I, I'm not fast enough to take stuff in and out between tunes. Right. So I kind of just set it and leave it. Mm-hmm. And it just becomes a little percussion palette for me. But I love that. But, you know, if we're doing something specific, like there was a piece on the new record that called The Call. Mm-hmm. We didn't play it for this concert, you know, but but mm-hmm. uh, but it it, uh, it has more preparations that are very specific inside of the middle register of the piano where mm-hmm. I have got uh, more metallic sounds that that um, are are triggered by yes. virtue of being associated with, attached to wood. Mm-hmm. And so you get these mis- mysterious kinds of colors um, that people, when they see me playing live, they, they kind of have to come up and they'll do exactly what you did <laughs> because they're like, they want to know. I didn't know where that was coming from because the drummer wasn't playing and I couldn't understand where that sound was, but right. it was really interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think when people are first maybe exposed to it, it doesn't sound like music or they're not quite sure how to uh, you know, process it. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes when you're seeing it, I know when, when we had that duo, we would play and, and and young kids would always want to come up uh, and see what what, what what was that you know right like, right am i allowed to do that i'm like well under very specific <laughs> instructions so right. that i tribute benoit for sort of you know l- teaching me a lot of what he'd been working on for many years and that's mm-hmm. sort of been a, a jumping off point as another color for me mm-hmm. um but even even without you know, coloring just a few vibratory overtones like that with wood. Mm-hmm. I still like sound is very important to me, and mm-hmm. and and the and you know the relationship to um, space mm-hmm. and, and and making sure that there's a, a certain quality to all the instruments and that blend. So that's why right. I really like. I spend a lot as much time as I can afford usually when I'm making a record to ensure mm-hmm. that I'm really happy with with the mix and the character of the instruments because okay. it, it, it's. I want to make sure it complements the music if I can. Right. You know, I mean, the music has to be there first. Thank you. 
Parker. And this new album, it's full of just what you said, um, serious considerations towards sound, but also space, um, your original compositions. Um, you also chose to cover a tune um, by a guy who we just lost in the natural, but his spirit is, is really large. Yeah. McCoy Tyner, mm -hmm. yeah, um, Passion Dance. J just tell us a little bit about why you chose that tune and how you arranged it, because it's very unique what you bring to that. Um, it, it's it's almost hard to get something new out of something so legendary, but you guys <laughs> do that. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I uh, it's interesting. I've been thinking about McCoy. I I mean, because the the last time I did a a, a live performance mm -hmm. was here in New York, and it was right before ever the world changed. Mm -hmm. And 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 I had come to New York and played at the Jazz Gallery with Ralph Alessi's band, mm -hmm. and and um, the following week McCoy passed. Mm -hmm. And um, I had done an interview for Downbeat like the day that I was as as, as I was doing the interview with for Downbeat, mm -hmm. the news broke that McCoy passed, mm. and so there was a lot of you know remembrances. And I went back to Michigan where I teach and and, and did mm -hmm. like a class where we kind of wanted to celebrate him. Mm -hmm. And and the thing about McCoy is that you know, most pianists really think of the world of music as pre and post McCoy, and there's sort of this very Mm -hmm. you know, profound line in the sand of like what we did and what our role was and, and maybe yes. how we heard the instrument and how we heard its potential pre McCoy, <clears throat> excuse me, and post McCoy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, is losing him right at the sort of dawn of this sort of COVID lockdown is kind of this mm -hmm. weird sort of symbolic yeah. thing where now pre, pre and post McCoy also has this mm -hmm. uh, other double meaning yeah. because it's like, we lose a such towering uh, a giant who's really shaped like it, it, you hear it in everybody's playing it. Yes. And if you don't, you kind of know where they've, where they've, where, where they developed. Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, of course the Coltrane quintet, the quartet yeah. that changed how we hear music. Mm -hmm. um, but I had few opportunities to, to interact with McCoy, but I had a few and it was, you know, it, but he had a huge influence on me, but I mean, I remember he came to see me play one time and hmm. it was, uh, you know, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And then I did a double bill at the Blue Note and he played, I was playing after him, but they didn't know if he wanted to play. And so they had a, yet another band in case he wasn't okay up for playing. But the yeah. night that I was playing, he was like, he really wanted to play. And so yeah. it was a long night because they had three bands. <laughs> You're right. Um, but I mean, he has such a huge influence on me and I, I sort of like kind of discovered you know, maybe there's a part of his playing that I, you know, kind of mm -hmm. still haven't internalized for sure. But 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 I I re have such admiration for the way he had the courage to find his place in in Cold Change Group. Yes, you know, and 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 um, I, that always kind of gave me momentum when I was coming up, and especially when I was in Steve Coleman's group and trying to find my place in that band. Okay, because it was a similar thing where you have this very strong personality as a saxophonist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whose direction is so unlike the contemporaries. So there isn't a model mm -hmm. to sort of kind of, how do I respond to these questions? Yeah. There is no answer that's just sort of been documented. Like you don't have this palette of, or this template, I should say, of, of, of answers. Mm -hmm. And I really identified with his, his role in that group to sort of find that answer when right. I was sort of faced with a similar challenge mm -hmm. of finding an answer in mm -hmm. Steve's group when I, was, when I first came to New York. Yeah, wow. Wow, that's a lesson, that's a lesson.
And as you mentioned, um, as an educator, you know, you're the steward of these young minds, these young performers. Yeah. Um, what do you really tell them at a time like this in a pandemic um, with COVID raging, but more so um, self-reliance is at an all-time high? And I was really struck by some of your comments earlier this year um, at the Jazz Congress on mm -hmm. the uh, Book Yourself panel, right. being your um, self-released uh, um, independent artist responsible for your own career trajectory. What do you encourage uh, students with during during a time like this? Well, I mean, I think that it, it, it's sort of, and it's something I'm going to be talking about a lot when we start school mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks, is that, you know, the, the idea that um, the uh, self-reliance is, is key, but, you know, sort of learning, you realize there's a lot of skill sets that you have to sort of begin to, Mm -hmm. uh, take into consideration mm -hmm. b aside from your instrument. And I think that th sort of having an openness to that is really important. But also mm -hmm. I think if, if, I mean, anybody that's alive right now cannot ignore the significance of how current events mm -hmm. and how economic uh, circumstances and social circumstances mm -hmm. influence art and influence people's lives, which mm -hmm. is, you know, then an extension, their art comes from their lives. Right. And I think sometimes in an academic environment, it's really easy to kind of get caught up with the mechanics of teaching how to play. Mm -hmm. And you know, so a big thing that I want to be able to focus on is like, well, no, no, we're going to look at lives. We're going to look at societies and look at like the, the forces that created this music because it's clear to everybody that who's alive right now. It's like, oh, it's affecting everybody. You know, like the circumstances, you can't go anywhere without having that kind of, impact uh, and, and recognizing that impact. And I think we can get a little sleepy with that and not, th not see it's historically always been that way. Right. Um, and so there's so much, there's so much going on in our, in our world today that it's sort of a reckoning of a lot of un, unresolved, uh, you know, injustices. And there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, just recalibrating mm -hmm. that's, that's at the surface right now. We're, we're kind of faced with, choices and i mean i i i cross my fingers and hope that there's enough common sense to really think wisely about making smart choices so that we're not yes uh squandering a good opportunity right. because it is an opportunity if we can mm -hmm. seize it you know there's i mean so much that's getting toppled in our music economy and our in our education systems i mean there's everything is really being rethought and it's some stuff there is little silver linings mm -hmm. so we have to be open to catch what those silver linings are and not be mm -hmm. sort of like uh, too nostalgic uh, to mm. the, the point that we can't, you know, embrace things. But I, mm. you know, it's hard because I do, I do like things that retain historical connectivity. You know, I mean, I'm playing an instrument that has it's sort of it's renown in in, in that regard. It's like it hasn't changed that much, right? In, in most of its history, mm. in a lot of ways, mm. um, you know, minor adjustments here and there, but it's a similar beast. Yeah. And it's like I'm confronting yeah. with this every day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I do appreciate these, you know, these sort of temples to to, to sort of past, you know, uh, achievement. So we we have to sort of find that balance because we do lose things as we progress or or evolve mm -hmm. or just move forward in time, you know. And then there's things that we want to try to retain. And as more, at, at the longer we go, the harder right. it is to figure out what to retain. Absolutely, absolutely. and what to study, you know. Absolutely. Well, I know through making this new record uh, with your trio Unison, um, the remission, uh, you've learned a lot along the way and uh, you've had your own resilience. Uh, if you can tell us some about that, just how the title of the record is, is influenced by your, your own uh, triumph. Yeah. Well, I mean, that part of that part of that sort of life change, life changing circumstances that I referred to in, in 2017, it was, was mm -hmm. also that I had got a cancer diagnosis at the time. And so I was... Mm. I was kind of facing uh, having to rethink how I live my life, right. and a lot of my energy had been going into larger projects with bands and and mm. and, and writing for different you know, ensembles and funding things and 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 being my own development office and really working myself a little too hard in mm. some ways, you know. Uh -huh. And I had to sort of think about how I wanted to make those adjustments, but I also had to make those adjustments in terms of how I. Uh, ate and, 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 and exercised and, and just lived my life, you know. So there was a lot of lifestyle reckoning. But you're reckoning as you're, as you're, you know, evolving as a person. And and I think that period was was very transformative for me to kind of think about what I what I was going to do next, yes. you know. 
as I saw the, an opportunity. And and so then the album title, The Remission, was just kind of partly, you know, kind of the way I spelt it, it was a, a lowercase r, but, uh, you know, right. but it was like, it's a mission because I'm on a path that I, 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 I enjoy having things, exp- you know, revealed to me and and figuring out what their what my response is going to be so i had an i had an opportunity and and i think you know i i was working really hard with dab theory and that like, as you mentioned that winning the juno was a really great yeah. uh, acknowledgement for work that i've been putting in not just the record that won but mm-hmm. the previous recordings and the evolution of the band was 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 yeah. a lot of you know blood sweat and tears mm-hmm. um and so that was kind of a nice um you know kind of way to sort of signal for myself it's like okay well uh, this is an easy you know it's not like i will never do anything with that group again right. but it's just it was a nice it was a nice point of entry um to have cho- in a way choices made for me to make choices you know ah. like because otherwise like I, as i said i was kind of procrastinating okay but then all these events you know people in the band were having babies or moving and things were just there was there was stuff happening where we couldn't tour, uh-huh. and so like you just life's life's ha- you know presents these new challenges, and then, and I was like, oh, there's the answer. Uh, it was there right in front of me, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cats that I knew, known, and were playing with, or have known for years, and it's just like, yeah, let's do this now, you know. And it was a good time. Absolutely. I remember our very first gig. It was just it was like it was all smiles. It was like really. Um, I was like, oh, this is a great first date. It was a great first way to kind of get you know feel like the choice was a good choice, mm-hmm. you know. Absolutely.